My name is Lucia Hindorf. I'm a program director at the NHGRI, and I'm joined today by several of my colleagues at NHGRI, as well as Dr. Damali Martin from NCI. So, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Please note that this app, this webinar is being recorded so that we can post it on the NHGRI webpage for this consortium afterwards. Please keep yourself muted up until it's time for questions, just to keep the the noise level down for everybody. Um, and then the way that we're going to run the webinar is to start by giving about 15 or 20 minutes of overview by NIH staff, followed by questions and answers. So if you could hold your questions until after the introductory portion, that would be great. Any WebEx questions or issues can be directed to Catherine Soleri at the email address you see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll start by explaining uh, briefly the rationale for this exciting consortium. So, as no doubt all of you are aware, polygenic risk scores are a burgeoning area of research in both epidemiology as well as clinical implementation. But the motivating factor for this consortium in particular is that there are increasing data that PRS prediction in non-European populations is poorer than it is in European populations. And these are some data from Alicia Martin and colleagues on the UK Biobank showing prediction accuracy across 17 anthropometric and blood panel traits. So what you can see here, see here is that relative to Europeans, that black dot, the prediction accuracy over all of these traits is lower in American and South Asian populations. It's about 0.6 fold of what it is in Europeans. And it's about half of what it is in East in East Asians and then a quarter fold in African populations. So we can see here that based on existing GWAS data that PRS prediction is, is vastly poorer in non-European populations. And what we would like to do in this consortium is really to accelerate scientific progress through bringing together data sets and expertise. These contributions include developing methods to improve the applicability of PRS to diverse populations. Integrating large scale cohort data with existing data that are currently dispersed across different resources. Increasing sample size and helping to improve performance of PRS in diverse populations. Developing approaches that can be applied to multiple health and disease measures. This is a characteristic of many our geno of our genomic medicine consortia where if one approach is developed to analyze um, or approach a, or study a particular disease, it can often be applied to multiple health or disease measures. So there's benefit and synergy in that regard. And then we're aware of a lot of other data sharing standards and efforts including those in PRS that are being developed in other areas and other programs around the world. And we expect that there will be synergy with those consortia and programs as well. So then there are a couple of overarching goals for this PRS RFA. First, to leverage genetic diversity to develop methods and to improve the applicability of these PRS across diverse populations and for a broad range of health and disease measures. And then to optimize the integration of large scale harmonized genotypic and phenotypic data to facilitate collaborative analysis, disseminate PRS related data and develop related resources. So we're, we're really focused on convening sites and data sets and expertise who can help us develop these collaborative analyses and disseminate the related resources that will help the broader community at large. There are several common consortium objectives. First, to identify and integrate data for relevant cohorts. There are a lot of existing data right now with differing levels of accessibility. And a goal of this consortium will to be to identify and bring together these cohorts that will be contributing to the different disease studies uh, based on PRS. Of course, this will involve standardizing the genomic and phenotyping data and mapping the traits to existing ontologies for harmonization across the different sites. Developing and applying methods to generating and refining PRS for diverse populations. Establishing external collaborations for PRS validation and implementation research, including those who are looking at clinical implementation of PRS, uh, such as the upcoming Emerge Consortium. And then identifying secondary uses related to health and disease research. And the idea here is that the infrastructure and the expertise that will be developed in this consortia could be broadly 
useful for studying other outcomes besides PRS potentially. One of the concepts that we wrote in the RFA was diversity first, and I wanted to take a moment to explain to you our approach to this. We are aware that there are a lot of other PRS studies, of course, that are ongoing, and even those in diverse populations. But as you all know, the most accessible data sets are likely to be those that have European ancestry participants. So for this consortium, we would like to emphasize the use of non-EA data until the maximum value has been extracted from them before exploring data from European ancestry participants. And this is true even if the EA data sets are much larger and more frequently utilized. So we, we really want to focus first on the non-European genetically diverse data. And so as you're putting together your applications, um, and, and if you are planning to include large numbers of European ancestry participants, we encourage you to describe the scientific purpose and pitfalls of using data from these potentially larger numbers of EA participants and then to think and justify the resulting biases and you know, think about more than just including these populations for a simple convenience or expediency. The RFA, the, the consortium is comprised of two different RFAs, study sites and coordinating center. And I will start by describing the expectations for the study site applicants. So study sites will bring existing cohorts together to maximize sample size and genetic diversity for cross consortium analyses. They'll address collectively the challenges related to differing availability of clinical data, data use limitations, and availability of summary statistics. They'll identify and harmonize health and disease measures for cross-consortium analyses, come up with ways to integrate ancestry into the analysis, identify metrics for improving PRS prediction, refining PRS based on updated data that are accessible to the consortium, Participate in consensus approaches to developing and applying PRS. This is a really important point I want to focus on because each of the site applicants will come in with the strengths of their research team and the research questions they're interested in exploring. But for this consortium, we really want to take advantage of the synergy among the sites. So we're expecting a lot of effort to be put in by each site to developing consortium approaches to analysis and dissemination. This would of course include contributions to cross consortium working groups, and then the last point to emphasize is that we do want to form this consortium with the idea that we'll be conducting research. And there's a section of the RFA that includes examples of research that you can think about as you put together your application and think about how this research fits into the broader goal of the consortium. For coordinating center applicants, we expect that they will provide overall and logistic and scientific coordination for the consortium. They'll lead the data science aims of the consortium, which relate to proposing fair approaches, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable approaches to data integration and analysis. They'll work with ANVIL and external standards groups. They'll lead cross-consortium genotype imputation efforts, cross-consortium outreach and dissemination efforts. And as needed, they'll provide and convene LC expertise. This is such a a hot research area and there's a lot of other related efforts going on. So we want to make sure that we have our pulse on the um, on where other avenues for PRS research and conversations are happening, which could definitely include LC expertise. There are two additional um, components to the coordinating center to help improve the data that will be accessible to the consortium. The first is to provide limited support for affiliate studies who may not necessarily be funded through the RFA, but may be able to contribute data and expertise to the consortium. And then um, for, the, for the first year only at the beginning of the consortium to provide some limited genotyping for uh, populations or participants of unique scientific value who do not have genotyping data yet. So because I've gotten a few questions about sort of what might the consortium look like, I thought it might be helpful. This is purely hypothetical, a cartoon of what a consortium like this could look like. This is showing five hypothetical study sites, a coordinating center and several affiliate studies. 
And the points that I want to emphasize here is that the, the study sites can really encompass a number of different models that meet the goals of the RFA. So it might be that one study site is only including one cohort that, that meets the goals, and then others could be including various numbers of cohorts as part of one application. So we're encouraging flexibility to meet the goals of the RFA. And I'm also showing how the coordinating center will be responsible for helping to invite and convening affiliate study sites as well. I want to talk a little bit more about the cross consortium focus of this RFA by giving you an example of how we see working groups coming together. So working groups are envisioned as the focal point for trait specific and cross consortium PRS analysis. The study sites will contribute domain and analysis expertise and the coordinating center will facilitate the research and the convening of the working groups. So Here's, for example, a hypothetical coronary heart disease working groups where the cohorts might belong to different study sites and then with affiliate study sites will come together and harmonize phenotypes and do PRS methods development and analysis. So this is sort of um, separate from each study site coming to a working group where we're looking at the cohorts that would actually be contributing data to analysis of that working group trait. As a consortium, there are several deliverables that are expected. So the first is project data sets with harmonized data. And these include summary statistics and metadata describing the cohorts. We encourage individual level data where possible, but if you look at the RFA, there are there's a whole section on data sharing that describes some of the nuances and um, some of the, the characteristics of the data sets that might be valuable to this consortium, but may not necessarily be able to share, share individual level data. We're expecting that consensus PRS models that are uh, developed by the consortium to be shared, including the SNPs, weights, and covariates that are necessary to interpret and apply the models, tools and resources that are developed by PRS investigators, policies and standards to enable data sharing, including LC. And then finally, any data and approaches facilitating validation in clinical settings. There are a number of other consortia, including eMERGE and other efforts that are likely to find results and resources from this consortia to be very valuable in clinical implementation of PRS. I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Dr. Ken Wiley, who will talk about the ANVIL resource that's described in the RFA. Well, thank you, Lucian. So I want to take a moment and just go over the ANVIL. This is NHGRI's um, cloud-based resource, funded cloud-based resource uh, that this group will uh, actually utilize. Um, the Anvil is actually um, a cloud-based infrastructure and software platform. In this case, it's built on top of the Google uh, Cloud Platform. Um, it's built to provide a shared analysis and compute environment so that investigators and users can um, have their own collaborations as well as work with uh, collaborations and consortiums can work in collaboration with other groups. Uh, the Anvil will also provide data access and data security. This on the same level as those provided by dbGaP. As a matter of fact, the Anvil is considered an NH designated uh, uh, repository. Um, in addition, it will house genomic data sets, phenotypes, and their related metadata. Because this is a cloud-based resource a bit off of the GCP or the Google, Google Cloud, uh, there are costs associated with using the Anvil. Those costs uh, include uh, egress charges, computes, and for storage. Um, however, the ANVIL will work, is also working with other groups at NH, such as the Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation, Sustainability Initiative, also known as the STRIDES Initiative, uh, that's being managed at CIT to find ways to, uh, to uh, manage some of those cost controls. Um, in addition, the ANVIL is not supposed to be focused on just power users. The ANVIL is, uh, so user training and outreach is actually critical because we want this resource to be used for the broader clinical and basic genomic, genomic science community. Uh, the ANVIL is not designed to be, in a, be developed as a silo. Um, the ANVIL participates in the, in the Federated Genomic Data Commons ecosystem, which is basically efforts that are um, uh, initiated by different NH-funded cloud-based resources to make our resources more interoperable with each other. Um, in addition, the ANVIL was focused on incorporating uh, new scientific and technological advances as the community requires them. If you go to the next slide, please. So I've talked about this shared workspace and shared environment. And I wanted to kind of go in a little more in depth about what I mean by that. Um, so in the case of this in work environment, the work we call, which we call workspaces, these workspaces are being provided by Terra. 
Um, in Terra, you will be able to have a workspace to do your own analysis, uh, bring other group members that you would like into your workspace to do shared analysis, as well as use workspaces as a cons at the consortium level to work with other consortium level, uh, other consortiums. So the workspaces will provide faceted search, uh, provide, let you leverage established pipelines and workflows, as well as do exploratory analysis and exploratory uh, workflows that you would like to develop to do your analysis. The instead of uh, trying to have a um, multiple, instead of trying to piece multiple development utilities together, um, the, the, this workspace will also provide an integrated development environment. Uh, this will allow for improved programmer productivity by providing software for authorizing, modifying, compiling, and deploying and debugging software. And because it's Terra, Terra already comes in, you may have to click the next one, see the next slide. Uh, because um, you just go ahead and click through all of them. Yeah, thank you. Um, because this is, we're using Terra, Terra will come with Jupyter Notebooks and Whittle for use. But because NHGRI has funded this resource, we wanted to add tools that are more common for the genomics community to use, uh, such as Bioconductor, with plans to bring the UCSC Genome Browser, Galaxy, and our Studio online on board this year. In addition, we have a doc store, Anvil-based doc store, that will be for sharing containerized tools and workflows. Next slide. You can learn more about the Anvil uh, by going to our uh, our portal page, uh, which is located, the address is located at the bottom right, uh, anvilproject.org. There you'll have information about um, the different aspects of the Anvil if you just click all the way through. Yeah, you'll learn about what the Anvil is, the data sets are available, the tools and training and resources that are available, as well as training, news, and um, events and points of contact. Uh, the Portal page will also provide access to understand how to submit data sets to the Anvil, as well as a link to actually uh, going to the Terra, web, Terra um, Anvil branded Terra page where you can start your accounts and um, um, start developing using your, work, your workspaces. And that's all I wanted to share with the Anvil. Thank you, Ken. And next, we have Dr. Damali Martin sharing a little bit about NCI and their involvement with this RFA. Damali? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, our colleagues at NHGRI for inviting us to be part of this initiative. And so, as many of you know, the mission of the NCI is to lead, conduct, and support cancer research across the nation to advance scientific knowledge and to help all people live longer, healthier lives. And we do this through a number of different ways, um, including uh, funding cutting edge research on cancer causes, treatment and prevention, um, training the next generation of researchers, and funding uh, cutting edge research as uh, such as uh, the ones that will be funded under uh, this initiative. Um, NCI is fully committed to address cancer disparities and the lack of representation of minority populations in genomic studies underscores the urgency to ensure appropriate representation in large genomic initiatives such as this one. Uh, next slide. And so we're really happy um, and excited to be collaborating with NHGRI on this initiative because this RFA is consistent with NCI's priorities to address cancer disparities among minority populations. Uh, we believe that it has the potential to address what we see as a major translational gap in genomic medicine um, and for future utilization of genetic um, information in the prevention and treatment of cancer. Um, it also aligns really well with our priorities under the NCI Moonshot Initiative, which many of you uh, may be familiar with, but the Moonshot Initiative um, aids to accelerate the pace of discoveries that enable better therapies while improving our ability to prevent cancer and detect it at an early stage. And so under this RFA, the NCI plans to fund one of the PRS centers. And while the RFA um, is not disease focused, um, we will only fund a center that's focused on cancer. And I'll stop there and turn it back over to Lucia. 
Great. Thanks so much, Damali. So we're um, getting ready to wrap up the introductory portion here. I did want to point out some other RFA sections of note. I've covered most of the high points of the RFA, but I would like people to particularly take a look at the data sharing in this initiative section to learn more about the expectations for data sharing within the consortium and external to the consortium. Um, it's always worth exploring um, the some of the more formal sections of the RFA and what we consider to be instructions to the applicants. A lot of this is described in the program formation and governance section, which describes how the consortium components fit together. The PHS 3 and 98 research plan has specific instructions for applicants who are applying to each of the RFAs. And then I always like to encourage people to take a look at the application review information. So this is what peer reviewers will be provided for as far as criteria for a review of your application. Um, and then a little bit more about the review and selection process from the standpoint of the funding agency. So we have some criteria in there that describe uh, programmatic priorities for NIH. Okay, so I'll conclude there and then we're gonna try and open this up for questions in an orderly way. Um, I Thank you for everyone who's joined us. We have quite a few people on. Um, let's start by letting people unmute themselves or typing in the chat box and we'll try and take your questions one by one. So the floor is open. And Catherine, you might have to help me. I'm not sure if anyone's raising their hands. Okay, let's see. I see a question in the chat. So should the proposed phenotypes be available across all the affiliate member cohorts in a study site? So I'm going to um, change the wording of this slightly. We have a specific uh, um, reference to affiliate members that we talk about in the RFA that has to do with the coordinating center recruiting affiliate member. So I'm going to address this as if the cohorts in this question apply to a single study site application. So the goal is basically to maximize the phenotype that are available across the entire consortium. But of course, as one applicant puts together their application, it's impossible to know who else is applying. So within your application, I would suggest that you maximize the amount of phenotype information that's available across the cohort. This may, across the, across the study site, across multiple cohorts. So this may mean that not every cohort has every phenotype, but you should be very clear in your application about the value across the cohort um, and provide sample sizes as appropriate for the different traits, if, if not everybody has every phenotype. Um, the second question was, should all the affiliate member cohorts have genotype data at the time the application is submitted? So the way that I've addressed this is that when you put together your application, you should be very clear about what your application will be able to contribute in terms of genotype data and phenotype data. Of course, um, sites, sites that have genotype that have data sets where the genotypes are already completed will be perceived as being more ready to be analyzed. We do allow for some flexibility if there is going to be genotyping available during the course of the project period, but you would need to describe that in your application um, and you would need to describe the, the readiness of those genotype data to be available. Um, if the genotype data are um, are potentially available but don't have funding yet, for example, then I think you need to be clear about that as well. So um, the basic goal here is to provide enough information about the data sets that could contribute to your application that reviewers and NIH can evaluate what, what that application would actually bring. Will all the in-person consortium-wide meetings be in the U.S.? This has implications for the budget. Um, I, yes, I would, I would make that assumption. Um, please confirm that the total budget $1 million includes the indirect cost. I believe this is for the study site applications, and yes, as described in the RFA, the $1 million is a total cost estimate, which includes indirect costs. Okay, I see a couple other chat questions. Let me see if there's any um, fo quick follow-up about what I just said. Was that clear? Okay, um, question, oh, yes? The explanations were very clear, thank you. Okay, thanks. Do we need to budget for ANVIL support? Um, short answer is yes. Um, there is a section in the RFA that describes how data sharing will be conducted and how the data integration will be done on the on the ANVIL. Um, I might turn it over to Ken to describe a little bit of the nuance about how those budgets, how you might think to get about putting together those budgets. Ken, yes, do you mind taking that one? Yeah, no problem. Yes. Yeah, so 
as I mentioned before, there is costs associated for the Anvil, which include egress, um, storage, and compute. Um, those are based off of marketing prices. And so there is a, since it's built on Google, if you went to Google's website, you can get a sense of what those costs are. Um, there are opportunities for us, as I mentioned before, to try to provide some, some uh, resources to help address that, but these are still in development. As I mentioned, the Strides effort, it's, we're beta testing Strides in the Anvil now, and we're still working on that, that pilot. Um, and so I would, my recommendation is that you budget at, for the market prices for using this resource. When we start making transitions to moving data to make them available to the public, then there will be there may be opportunities to have costs uh, offset for that because we're working with the Anvil team to help facilitate ways for making data that's available through open or controlled access to the public. Um, have those costs for storage offset, um, but aside from that, those costs would be. Uh, applied to the user, so you should budget accordingly for those costs. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, let's see, I'm going to keep going down the chat. Does the coordinating center have to develop the same set of activities as a study site, or will it have only coordination activities as described in the slides? So the slides really are a, a really high level overview and very brief. So I would encourage CC applicants to read the RFA, but I will answer this question in terms of the overall consortium goals are the goals for both the coordinating center and the study sites. And even though I've highlighted specific areas where we're expecting the coordinating center to take the lead within the consortium, they are full members of the consortium. And so we're, we're relying a lot on the coordinating center for scientific leadership as well as kind of facilitating and coordinating. So I would encourage applicants to read the RFA and again, some of the instructions about the specific areas, scientific areas that we'd like applicants to address there. Okay, what's the difference between affiliate study and cohort in the diagram of page nine of your presentation? Let me just go back there and we can take a look. Okay, so it's this one. Okay, so cohorts are depicted here as data sets, cohorts that are submitted as part of a study site application. So someone who sends in a grant application for a study site may convene in this diagram anywhere from between one and six different cohorts that they're gonna bring to their application. So those applications are funded, but then of course there will be other data sets that aren't funded as part of the consortium uh, study sites, but may be evaluated to the consortium. So the coordinating center will be tasked with inviting affi these affiliate studies who aren't funded as part of the study sites, but might provide data sets and expertise. And, and if you read the coordinating center RFA, there will be some funding provided to the coordinating center to pay um, for limited personnel for these affiliate studies to participate in the consortium. Um, that was clear. Can we do computing on our own local cluster? Ken, I think that's one for you. So that's actually a very good question. We are encouraging groups to use the Anvil, but we understand that due to both geographical and, and situ situations that you may have to do some uh, computes on your local cluster. So we we understand that we would we. We, but we are encouraging people to use the Anvil for this for this effort, but it's not an exclusive one. Thanks, Ken. Can you take the next one too? The RFA said that the storage cost will come from the CC budget and is ambiguous ambiguous about computation. Um, yes. Yeah, so the RFA that the storage cost will come from the coordinating center budget, and that is M. Okay, so that's a good question. So there are, this is something we'll have to work with the coordinating center on, but because there's data sets that you're going to be uploading that, that may be covered by the coordinating center, but uh, separate data sets you may, or ancillary data sets that you may be bringing will be expected to be covered by the site. So we'll have to work with the coordinating center on that. But I would, again, I would have you budget accordingly for the storage computes and egress. And then we can work with you if we need to, if those, if those costs um, need to be modified. Oh, yes, so the second part of that question, can you confirm that study sites should budget for egress and computing? Sounds like yes. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm kind of lost. Oh, sorry. Um, 
Yes. So I'm, I'm, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Sorry. I, I saw another, no, I I saw another one that popped up and I was just kind of lost. Yes. I know, um, I know. It's like, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So egress will, yes. The, the short answer to that question is if the RFA state storage costs will come from CC and it is an ambiguous about computation, can you confirm that SS should budget for egress and computing? Yes. Great. How are you planning to evaluate an application if two study sites contribute with overlapping cohorts, perhaps with different phenotypes or overlapping cohorts? So this is a question I've been getting, and the simple answer is that we are starting at the level of encouraging if, if, if people belong to cohorts um, who are actively analyzing data and um, who uh, are, are active members of those cohorts, we're, we're encouraging cohort leadership to kind of come together and help prioritize the applications that will be submitted to the RFA. That's not always easy to do because some applications may be including multiple cohorts. So the way this is going to work is that, of course, each application will be peer reviewed and that each application will be reviewed on its own merits. But at the time that the NIH is ready to make funding decisions, we'll obviously take a look at potential overlap among different applications that scored well. And we'll have to work with the PIs of those applications to minimize the overlap among the cohorts. So I, I think we recognize that there are cohorts that are likely to be proposed across multiple applications, but NIH, of course, uh, will not be funding duplicative efforts. So that will uh, need to be evaluated uh, after review to the extent that that um, cohorts are are uh, going going to not be able to address this at the time of application. So yeah, I think I think that's. I think that's how I would answer that. Um, was that clear? Are, are there other questions related to overlapping cohorts? I, we've been getting quite a few people who have had that question um, to me over email. Okay, if not, I'm gonna move on. Are you expecting diversity within a study site or can a study site represent a single non-European group of cohorts? Um, so I might need a little bit of clarification. Diversity within a study site as re reflective of multiple non-European groups. We need a question. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, were you expecting to have European and non-European groups within a single study site, or can they all be non-European? They can all be non-European. So let me put up a slide. Let's see that. A visual summary of some of the language we had in the RFA. So we had some strongly encouraged criteria, which is at least one non European group with at least 10,000 participants, or if you have at least 20,000 participants, 50% of whom come or more come from non European ancestry groups. So they can. You can include only non Europeans, or you can include Europeans, but we ask that people meet the criteria of having at least 50% of participants come from non European ancestry group. And then you can see some additional higher priority criteria here. So, so we're encouraging everyone to at least meet the strongly encouraged criteria if you're going to apply. And then please take a look at these high priority criteria as they will be factored into uh, funding decisions as well. Um, is there a limit to the phenotype table in the appendix? One table, multiple tables merged across. Um, I'm not sure if you're asking about a page limit. I don't believe that as long as you're responding to information that the RFA is requested, that there is a limit to the to the phenotype tables in the appendix. As far as how you present the table, as if it's one table, multiple tables um, merged across the cohorts. I would encourage applicants to think um, carefully about how reviewers might be able to um, best get a sense of the value that you're bringing to the table. So, yes, you probably could put together multiple tables if you're, for example, putting together five cohorts, but think about how easy it's going to be for reviewers to get a sense of the value of your data. And if, I think if there's anything that you can do to make it reviewer easier for reviewers or for NIH staff to understand. Who, uh, which participants, which phenotypes you're bringing to the table, I would encourage you to, um, to, to think carefully about how to present those data. Okay. Are there funds for new genotyping? So I did mention in 
um, the coordinating center priorities that we would be providing some limited funds for high value cohorts. So the way that will work is that after the consortium is funded, those high value uh, cohorts or participants will be ident identified. So if you're a study site applicant and you would like to pursue genotyping, that is not something you should include as part of your study site application. Don't request um, budgets for genotyping um, because those those won't be considered for the study site applications. But um, you know, some people have asked if if we have high value cohorts, but um, they're not genotyped yet. Is it okay to mention them in the RFA? I, I would say you know they shouldn't count towards meeting the goals of the RFA. Um, the, the common collaborative goals that I mentioned before, because they're not, they're not yet available, but if you have ideas for examples of high value cohorts that, you know, the coordinating center could be, uh, um, considering for the limited genotyping, I think that's fine to mention. Okay, um, Damali looks like this one's for you for the NCI funded study site Would this study site be expected to only cover cancers or would cancers be 1 of several dis different diseases. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, preferably, uh, we would prefer uh, grants to only cover cancers, but if there is a um, really good grant that application that comes in that is looking at cancers and other diseases, we will also consider it. Okay, thanks. And yeah, I think um, a lot of the cancer cohorts will have, I mean, their primary focus is, even if their primary focus is cancer, they may have other phenotypes that could be um, used for cross consortium analysis as well. So, I, I mean, I would encourage people to you know, obviously uh, emphasize your cancer strengths, but other phenotypes that you might also have available. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Suggestions for how the coordinating center should budget for storage and collaborative analysis on Anvil when sample sizes and data volumes are unknown. Is there a floor or ceiling on data size that should be used for budgeting purposes? Uh, Ken, I'll start and then I, I'm going to ask you to chime in, but um, I, I think that, you know, as far as the number of sites we'll know um, from the RFA, you know, we, we have a range of, of sites that that will be potentially funded. And then the study site criteria, which you see here is definitely sort of a floor for what we hope people will come in with. But I, I agree, this is probably something that we don't know necessarily what the ceiling will be. So Ken, I might ask you to chime in to see if you have any thoughts for, for how people should budget with this uncertainty in mind. I mean, so you pretty much covered it. It's the idea you start with what was in the RFA as your foundation and then, you know, budget according, you know, from that with the understanding that, I mean, as we get more and more into, you know, the program, get a better sense of what we're looking for. You know, we can work with you to make adjustments if need be. Um, when I say we and I can work with you to make adjustments if need be to cover if the if the costs are are vary from what was originally proposed. But for now, I, I agree, start with your initial budget for what you see in the RFA and go from there. Yes, and NIH is going to have to do some work as well in preparing to fund this consortium to take a look at, you know, the, the number of, not just the number of study sites, but the number of cohorts and the number of sort of um, places that these data reside, because I think that could have impact on the budgeting as well and how many sort of touch points to Anvil we need. Um, so hopefully that was helpful, we, even though we don't have a firm number that you should be using. Um, there's some first principles um, for you. Commitment to data sharing, if some studies cannot share individual level data, could they be still be part of some uh, of study sites by running U01 analyses in house? So every application is probably going to address this a little bit differently you know some people who who are only proposing to use individual level data who uh, that can be shared with everybody i think that's a much more straightforward model but if you read the rfa we do allow for um some flexibility in, for example if some data sets aren't able to contribute individual level data then you know describe the way that the summary statistics can be used um so i think when you're thinking about limitations about data sets that you're thinking about using the key thing to think about is tie them to the goals of the rfa and be very clear about how those data will be used so i think you could still propose to include data sets where summary statistics could be shared but the onus is more on the applicant to describe how those 
um, data sets will be useful to the consortium and propose ways that they could be shared uh, with the consortium, if not through individual level data. Well, cohorts may have hundreds of phenotypes available that could be used to evaluate new PRS methods. Should the study site proposal select a specific number of phenotypes to evaluate as part of the project? Oh, this is hard. Um, hundred, yeah, hundreds of phenotypes is a lot. I, I mean, I think it's gonna be a judgment call in terms of how you describe the value of your application. So, um, you know, I'm guessing hundreds of phenotypes could be like ICD-9 codes, for example. So, um, an applicant is going to have to describe to a reviewer and to NIH sort of what the primary strengths of those applications of their cohorts are. So I would I would suggest again going back to the goals of the RFA um, and then really highlighting the primary value of the cohorts, but you know describing the potential breadth because I think we will be looking for some flexibility once the cohorts are convened to include phenotypes that maybe a site didn't think about um, making as a primary phenotype, but would still be available for cross-consortium analyses. So, and I, I think that will probably will be complicating that appendix table that we spoke about either. I, I don't know that including hundreds of phenotype tables would be helpful. Um, but again, I think, you know, you need to use your best judgment as to what phenotypes, what traits, what participants are going to contribute the most to the overall goals of the RFA and then tailor your application that way. And if you have specific questions, um, feel free to follow about your data set. Feel free to follow up with me um, over email. Okay, can one next question, can one propose to use public data only, e.g. dbGaP? So I have gotten this question about what data sets are appropriate to propose. Can we propose data sets that are already available? And the answer is, so I'm, I'm going to refer back to the study sites and I'm assuming this is for the study site. So, you know, think about how you're going to meet these criteria. It could be a combination of public data as well as other data that aren't publicly available, but consider that if the public, if you're only going to be using public data, public data are available to um, to the scientific community at large. So the onus is going to be on you as an applicant to describe how you're going to use those data to meet the goals of the RFA and what specific strengths your research team will bring to using the, those public data. So short answer, yes, but I think there needs to be a little bit more um, thought and more work done in the application to explain how those public data will be used to meet the goals of the RFA. Um, and then also, um, if, if you're planning to use public data, I think there is still the onus to describe in the application, the um, ability of those public data sets to meet the data sharing section of the RFA. So, so you need to have some familiarity about how those data could be used within the consortium as well. So we're not just looking for lists of data that, um, that could be used um, from dbGaP, for example. Okay, um, we're at the end of the chat. Let me, let me see if anyone wants to um, chime in with the question. Yeah, it looks like we got one more in the chat. Okay, thanks. Can you please clarify how many affiliate members the CC should plan to support for travel to in-person meetings? RFA suggests that CC supports up to 10 affiliate members traveling to three meetings a year, i.e. 30 trips annually into supporting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand this question. Are you saying that the RFA language about supporting up to 10 affiliate members for three meetings a year isn't clear? Um, this is Sari. I guess I just wanted to confirm that that interpretation was correct. Yeah, I, I have to go back to the RFA actually. Did it, did it say 10 affiliate members traveling to three meetings a year or traveling to annual meetings or something like that? Um, I, I think whatever we put in the RFA is, is the guidance to follow, but I, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head actually, but maybe we can follow up on that if it's not clear. My apologies. Okay, thanks so much. Any other questions? Any comments from NIH staff? Let me let me um while I go to the final slide here. Um, any other questions from NIH? Or any other um, comments from NIH staff about the RFA? No. Okay. 
Okay. Nothing from me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I will just leave you with this final slide here. If you have additional questions, feel for feel free to contact me for NHGRI and Damali for NCI. Um, let me mention one thing, which is just keep an eye out for any additional notices related to this RFA. Um, the webinar, of course, you all found from the notice, hopefully. So thank you all for joining. Um, I want to let people know there is, I've gotten some questions about the due date for the RFA. It's currently June 23rd. If that due date gets extended, you will see it posted in a notice. Um, that will be coming out in the NIH guide. So you might want to keep an eye on that. So no official word at this time though. Okay, if there are no questions, we will go ahead and thank everyone for joining this applicant webinar. Um, we thank everyone for their interest. We're really excited about this consortium and the applications that we'll be getting. So thanks everyone, have a good day and um, stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.